Agenda with Michael Knight on News Radio 560 KPQ and KPQ.com. Ten minutes past one o'clock at News Radio 560 KPQ. Time for the show to begin. It's the agenda, the show with no agenda whatsoever. My very special guest is Robert Mulder. Robert is the candidate for the Chelan County Commissioner District 2, and we welcome you to KPQ. Nice to have you here, sir. Thank you, Michael. I'm glad to be here and speak with you and your listeners. I'm... Let's start with the fact that you're running as an independent. Can you explain that? Well, yeah. If um, Some of your viewers, I'm certain, uh, read the Wenatchee World, and actually in my declaration of uh, candidacy, I've spoke to the fact that I've been a lifelong Republican, but yet I've voted both sides of the ticket for the right candidate uh, when, when the times needed it. Um, I'm filing as an independent. I'm the only independent on the ballot. Uh, the reason I did that is because I'm tired of the polarity in politics. It's starting to permeate our local government as much as it is uh, certainly a part of the national uh, political picture. And so better to serve than to actually represent a party. Well, I just think that um, given that this commissioner district runs from the Wenatchee foothills all the way up beyond Coles Corner and Lake Wenatchee, uh, we have pockets of community all up and down the valley that has its own little flavor. And I want to try to represent everybody. I believe everybody needs to have a voice in local government. And so, again, I'm trying to step away from the polarity. Uh, of all the races that we're talking about for the 12th district, for the commission, for the city councils, for various uh, legislative seats that are up for grasp, a number of people are running as independents for the first time. It seems to be something that's increased. And you identify yourself as an experienced person, fiscally conservative, but years of independent thinking. And that's a uh, that that's a probably a description of most of the people listening right now. Well, I hope so. I hope that uh, folks will find a connection with me and my candidacy. I'd like to uh, share with your audience a little bit about why I chose to, to run for That's this a, office. That was, that was a, a day of decision, wasn't it? It certainly was. Um, but it, didn't, it was not something that I took lightly. Um, Commissioner Gaynor, who's not seeking re-election for this position, uh, in his last election four years ago was kind of espousing that he thought he might be stepping down, that, that could be his last term. And well, in fact, it's turned out to be so. And um, I was quite shocked to see as early as February some people announcing their candidacy when I knew that the filing week was in May. So I just sat back and took pause to try to see who were the candidates that were going to step forward. And I really didn't see anything in those candidates that I thought uh, was going to serve our community well. Uh, so on the final day of filing, on the Friday afternoon, I came in and filed again as an independent. I see now that I'm espousing that I'm independent. Um, other candidates are trying to say, well, I'm independent too, but the reality is is that they chose to file under no preference, uh, not as independent. And so I think that that's a telling fact about individuals. Let's go back to the beginning. You're a rookie in terms of running for office, but your your years of service are pretty well established. One, one, it starts in South Dakota, doesn't it, the story? Yeah, I, um, I grew up in an agricultural community, a farm and ranch country in uh, south central South Dakota along the Nebraska border. A small town of Martin, South Dakota, was the county seat. And after getting out of high school, I went off and joined the Army because I wasn't quite sure which path my life was going to take me. And good fortune for me because when I got out of the Army, I was able to uh, pursue a higher education. Um, I got a degree in criminal justice studies from the University of South Dakota with a minor in political science. Aha, you might political say science. Were planted. <laughs> Um, were you a you, did you choose political science because you thought it would be a good companion with the uh, with the idea of criminal justice or did just something that always appealed to you about the political life of this country? Uh, that's exactly what happened. Like uh, I think uh, young minds uh, seeking higher education, you follow the advice of a counselor, and I had already worked as a deputy sheriff um, by the time I uh, sought an opportunity at the university level and. So naturally, I thought I needed to have a criminal justice degree, and my uh, my advisor said, well, you should seek a major in criminal justice and, and a minor in political science. And so maybe the seeds of serving politically uh, were planted early on in my, my lifetime. So you finish school, you get yourself an education, you begin working in law enforcement. Yeah, so um, even while I was going to school full-time, I was working full-time as a police officer in the university town of Vermilion, South Dakota, um, I eventually found my way into law enforcement opportunities with land management agencies, and I worked for the National Park Service at Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, my first full-time job with the National Park Service was in uh, Lake Mead National Recreation Area uh, in southern Nevada. I lived in the small town of Boulder City, which coincidentally had a lot of 
influence uh, by a large urban neighbor of Las Vegas. <laughs> yes. And it speaks to some of my campaign and what I think I'm going to try to bring to my candidacy in that we do have influences from a larger urban neighbor to the West uh, that are, in fact, impacting um, our local community. And we need to be prepared to deal with those kinds of impacts. So you finished with your career not in Lake Mead, but you came closer to the Wenatchee Valley finally. Ten years ago, I uh, took an opportunity uh, here in Wenatchee. I worked out of the Wenatchee supervisor's office. I had been promoted uh, to the law enforcement supervisor for the U.S. Forest Service. And out of the office here in Wenatchee, I was supervising officers uh, scattered over seven-county area here in central and eastern, northeastern Washington. Um, I supervised officers on the Colville, Okanagan, and Wenatchee National Forest. And as such, I had a lot of interaction with uh, county government, particularly with the sheriff's offices in each of those counties, um, to try to further our mutual interests in protecting the people that visit our, our public lands and that are in those communities. Speeding right along with your whole life story, which I think is a good one, uh, you you left the Forest Service, you took uh, retirement from them, I guess an early retirement, legal but early. Yeah, so uh, it's not uncommon. Well, uh, most federal law enforcement agencies, it's mandatory retirement age 57. I'm only 53. If you follow the sage advice of retirement counselors, you start thinking about transitioning into a second career or other opportunities. And so uh, when I became eligible for optional early retirement, I seized upon that. I've been doing some consulting work for a law firm out of Idaho on some labor management issues. But um, primarily, I've been following greatly um, Keith Gaynor's desire to either run for re-election or to not run and seek another uh, opportunity. He's obviously going to run for House of Representatives. So it's creating an opportunity here. There's obviously five candidates. I'm one of them that thinks that they have what our community needs, and I'm looking to serve. Five candidates for three seats. Well, let's look at the, the, the I guess, the, the motivation for actually throwing your hat in the ring, because following politics is one thing. You live in Chelan, right? No, I live in Kashmir. I'm sorry. Yes. Kashmir. My apologies, Kashmir. Don't hold it against me. I didn't know what I was saying. The, uh, the, the, the result of your, you know, you're there at the kitchen table looking over the, the gritty affairs of the day, and you say, you know what, I think I just got to get into this race. What was it that pushed you over, and what was, what was the number one motivating factor, please? Well, as I started to see the candidates that stepped forward, um, I was looking at their backgrounds and what they were bringing. But perhaps most importantly, um, I had researched what a typical campaign might cost a candidate that wanted to serve. And I went to the financial disclosure website, um, pdc.wa, I believe is the actual address where this information is available to all uh, voting citizens in the state of Washington. It shows the voter how, what the campaigns have raised. Yes, yeah, and um, I could see that uh, one candidate in particular had raised in excess of $19,000 at that time, and it was just the candidate filing week. And I had to question um, all other prior uh, campaigns for the uh, seat two of the commissioner district. You know, a typical campaign was five to $6,000. So why bring so much money into a campaign? I, I, I just felt like um, a candidate, certain candidates were – maybe in it for the wrong reasons. And I thought that I should step forward and uh, prepare my candidacy. So here you are, one of the five. What are the issues that burn you the most, not burn you, <laughs> motivate you the most? Well, I think that um, coming from a law enforcement background, I have had a, a lot of experience and exposure serving our community, whether it was as a law enforcement officer um, and somewhat of a firefighting capacity. Uh, most of the folks in land management are expected to have some sort of skill set related to firefighting capacity. And, and of course, uh, being trained as an EMT at one time, you know, you're the first responder to a lot of medical scenes. So fire EMS and law enforcement are some of the primary county community services that um, our citizens need and deserve. But we have huge traffic problems to get those services through a high tourism area of, of uh our local communities. Summertime in Leavenworth and Kashmir, busy time. It could be horrendous. And I did have an opportunity to visit with uh, the fire chief up there recently. He's talking about, you know, they've got to stage resources on the other side of town now because they can't get through town and you need to be prepared to respond. Well, of course, that ha comes with costs. And uh, heaven forbid that 
we need to be able to get the resources from one one location in the county to another and not be able to get through those traffic zones. So traffic's a big concern for me. Some people would say, well, that's a city issue. Some people would say it's a state issue because it's a state highway running through a small town. Well, they're all right, aren't they? They, they are. And uh, the county commissioner has a dog in the hunt with all of these uh, organizations and entities to try to make sure that community services um, are available to all. And I'm really concerned about um, the equitability of services to everybody up and down the county. What do the people that you've talked to say that they wanted a new commissioner? Because there's going to be a lot of new faces on the commission one way or the other. Well, I've actually, uh, my wife and I have been out knocking on doors. Oh, and, have you really? Yes. Oh, and, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody's very welcoming, and everybody has a, a perspective. And, and, you know, it seems like the hot-button issue uh, in the Leavenworth area is the adjustment of property taxes. And um, I've certainly been the recipient of those property tax adjustments in my 10 years that I've lived here in Kashmir. Where's that money going after the adjustment? Well, those are good questions, and, you know, I certainly have had time to look at the budget a little bit. Maybe I need to educate myself a little bit more clearly on those issues. But the important thing is that people are feeling a pinch that they weren't really expecting to feel, and um, that's certainly a concern of all the citizens up and down the valley. Uh, but uh, they also are concerned about the traffic issue and the, the inability to get in and out of their community on any given day. You have to plan around the traffic impacts. We've talked about traffic a couple of times now. Who is actually responsible for the traffic in the in the in the towns of the of the county? Well, again, I think it's there's multiple agencies that are responsible. For it. Obviously, it's a state highway, state troopers, yeah, that runs through uh, our our local communities. Um, but we all have a dog in the hunt on the issue. Um, I was going to uh, try to touch on a, a little bit um, more broader issue, and that Go ahead. is that. Um, our bigger neighbor to the west is impacting housing prices, and that's also driving uh, the property tax rates. Um, somebody told me that recently somebody just bought a house that would otherwise been, you know, of rentable quality or even move-in quality and tore it down to the foundation and rebuilt a million-dollar home, and that's going to drive property values in our area. It also uh, creates an issue where there's a lack of housing for the workforce, uh, a lot of thriving small businesses up and down the valley rely on uh, entry-level minimum wage workers, you know, to support their businesses. We have a beautiful community up and down the valley. You know, there's opportunities, whether it's in Kashmir or Leavenworth or wherever you might live in the county. And we want to see that uh, those small businesses continue to thrive. But if they don't have a sustainable workforce that can live in the local area, that's going to create a crisis. And well, the crisis is already here in, in every in every town in the in the county and in Douglas as well. The housing shortage chokes off development, chokes off growth, chokes off more people moving here to take jobs that they that they would have taken had they been able to find a place to live. It's really amazing uh, the stories that I hear about people who committed to a job in Wenatchee and then eventually just said, "I'm sorry, I have to turn it down because I can't find a place to stay." Yeah, it, it, those are just uh, horrible stories to encounter. I've got friends that are, you know, living uh, two families to a house just to try to get enough money accumulated to make a down payment on a home. And, and you probably know it, it affects both ends of the spectrum in terms of finances. The the the, the, the wealthy and the well-to-do don't can't find a home to buy for the for the most part, and those who are on a serious budget have the same problem at the other end, trying to find a place to rent. Yeah, it's, it's an issue affecting everybody in the county, and uh, we definitely need to be proactive and engaged on proper zoning uh, for the right kind of development, managed growth, um, so that we can deal with these issues. And I fear that um, our local economy can be threatened if we don't have a workforce that's viable uh, to take these jobs. And blunted in a way that we find it very hard to measure when you can't follow every job that doesn't pan out or every uh, executive that almost moved here but didn't. I mean, th 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 those are pretty gray areas to, 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 uh, to follow along accurately. Yes, yeah. So um, one of the, so we've talked about two of my planks in my platform, traffic and housing. And the, uh, if we could move on to maybe a third plank in my platform. Yes, sir, go right ahead. So... Uh, I have the great fortune of having worked for a land management agency and understanding the impacts of fire. Um, just last summer, I was down in Kittitas County, our neighbor to the south. They had the Jolly Mountain Complex fire. And uh, I'm sad to say that there are some properties there that were potentially devalued based on their in indefensible space. 
And I think that we can do a whole lot more in some of our communities to be more firewise. And I'd rather see some of the money directed towards preventative uh, fire programs. But more particularly, we need to do some hazardous fuel thinning. And it seems like nobody wants to do that because that's the difficult, dirty work to do, and you have to program your dollars to do that. One shrub at a time, right? Absolutely. And there's some great examples in our communities where they've done a, a great job doing that. But we need to do more. And it's not simple enough to say, well, we'll deal with that problem when the fire starts. I mean, we do do a great job responding to fire in this community. or We have very talented firefighters. I'm just suggesting that we need to do more up front. Uh, a dollar of prevention uh, goes a long ways uh, versus, you know, having to fight a fire in an emergency status. Uh, the taxpayer dollars, you know, just vaporize when you're responding in an emergency. I'd rather see us be proactive and engaged up front. Um, doing some hazardous fuel thinning in some of our um, land interface where it interfaces with some of our communities that uh, are, you know, in, t near, in or near timber. And there's so. acres and acres. Well, there was one fire last year that started with hot ordnance hitting the grass with guys that were out target shooting. And they were there when it happened, and they couldn't move fast enough to stop that fire from spreading. Yeah. If it'll give you some idea about how, t how tender dry some of the areas are. I think the specialists in this arena that, are considered to be, you know, hazardous fuel managers um, would say that they want to do more fuels management so that there isn't a problem. But, of course, everybody equates fire with smoke and air quality issues. Well, we've got to, we've got to tolerate a little bit of smoke periodically to manage these lands in a favorable situation so that we don't have catastrophic wildfire in our community. And it's a fortune to uh, – controlled burns, one, are expensive, but also they're dangerous – a lot of things can crop up during the day of a controlled burn. This would be a good example of a terrible morning to be doing any controlled burning because we have winds to 15 here in town, and, and I'm sure at Waterville it's worse than that. This is true, and but um, with a little bit of pre-planning um, yeah. and forethought, and I would say that you can take that pre-planning and forethought off of the fire topic and apply it to many other things that the county is doing. You need to be proactively engaged on all issues. You need to be forward-thinking. We need to bring some progressive views from some experiences that I would speak to that I'm bringing from having lived in other parts of the country and other small towns that have had similar impacts. And the only way you can do that is to have a little bit more progressive outlook and empower people uh, to bring those progressive views to the table. Have you ever knocked on a door and had someone give you an idea? So, you know what we need in this town is blankety blank. Um. <laughs> Because funny. most people know what they want. You know, they want lower taxes and safe neighborhoods. Well, good luck. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned that, I, I thought you were going to ask a different question, and that is that my wife and I were run down the driveway of, of somebody that we thought was a prospective <laughs> voter, and he certainly was a registered voter, but as soon as a politician was knocking on the door, he wanted nothing to do with us. And um, I was able to actually use uh, some persuasive discussion Reverse skills. psychology. Yeah, and try to get him engaged and, like, to let me know what his issues were. Uh, he's pretty frustrated with uh, government, uh, national government, local government, all government. Uh, he just feels like um, all of us uh, might be wasting his tax dollars. And so we definitely need to be engaged and, and do things more thoughtfully. Well, I can't argue with him on in his views about the world of government. But at the same time, does that create a uh, an activist ad attitude that creates more voters? Or does it create a, um, a, a who cares attitude that creates less voters because we can't get below, you know, we're sometimes 30 percent is a good turnout. That's not much of a turnout. That's correct. And it's just another shocking thing that you just touched on there. And now that I'm a candidate, you know, you get access to the voter rolls so that you can go down and, and, and engage voters door to door. And I'm surprised at uh, even neighbors that I have that, you know, were very voiceful on certain political issues. I'm finding out now that they're not even registered. And what a sad situation that is. Oh, no, that's that, that's that's America. <laughs> the people who grouse the most are the ones who don't vote or yep. don't have a dog in the hunt. But yeah. but but imagine that they do. And in reality, they're right. They do. They do have a, a reason to be concerned. But to be concerned and not vote. I mean, I just want to get up my switch that my grandmother used to use rather well, uh -huh. as they say in Texas. Well, I don't know why they call it a switch, but it's, I think it's because of the way it makes the sound through the air. But I, I knew when it was coming. My. Uh... I think my grassroots campaign here by going door to door, I'm, I'm listening to folks and what they have and what their concerns are. I'm trying to suggest to them uh, what my platform looks like. And I really want to emphasize the fact that 
Uh, I come from conservative roots, from an agricultural community. As I said, when I drove into this area to take this promotion. Looks like home. I felt like home. This is my home now. I'm not going anywhere. Um, and I tell my friends and family back home in South Dakota and in northern Colorado that they can come visit me. And uh, <laughs> they can enjoy what we have here uh, as visitors. But um, I don't see myself going anywhere anytime soon. Our very special guest is Robert Mulder. He's a candidate for the Chelan County Commissioner's District Number 2 seat. Mr. Mulder, would you ask the constituents for their vote, please? Um, again, my my uh, my fiscal conservative roots come from an agricultural community in South Dakota, but I've made my home here for the last 10 years and plan on being here for the, the future. And my wife, I met her here in Wenatchee. She's actually grew up in Battleground, uh, an area just outside of Vancouver, Washington. So we have ties uh, to this region. Um, what I hope that folks will see in me is that, again, I, I said with clear conviction in the Wenatchee World article that I had been a lifelong Republican. However, I'm the only candidate that has filed as an independent, and I'm filing as an independent because I know that there's a broader voice that needs to be heard in local government. Uh, I hope that you will look at seriously at my candidacy, and more importantly, I'd hope that you also look at some of the other candidates and what it is that that their motivations are. I seriously have to question a candidate that brings six times what a previous candidacy for this position uh, monetarily has taken. Um, I think there's a candidate, uh, Mr. Bugert, he has nearly $28,000 in his campaign fund, um, whereas all my research for uh, Mr. Gaynor's seat in the previous 12, uh, excuse me, the previous 16 years has never exceeded $6,000. Um, if you'll go to votemolder.com, my last name is spelled with an E, that's V-O-T-E-M-O-E-L-D-E-R.com, uh, you'll find uh, more information about my candidacy, or you can call 509-888-5490. That's my campaign phone. I'd be happy to give you clarity about my candidacy um, and answer any questions that you might have. And if you want to invite me to a community function in your area or, or just uh, your house with your neighbors, I'd be happy to come and let you know about my candidacy. His name is Robert Mulder, M-O-E-L-D-E-R. He's running for the Chelan County Commissioner.